Hey team, Jack Delosa here. Australia's largest and most transformational event exclusively for six, seven and eight figure business owners, the Unconvention is back. The Unconvention was voted the top three events in the world by Entrepreneur Magazine. At the Unconvention, you're gonna hear from the world's best entrepreneurs all on the one stage whose businesses are worth a collective $8.5 billion. You'll be hearing from Lorna Jane Clarkson from Lorna Jane, Larry Diamond from ZipPay, Samantha Wills from Samantha Wills Jewelry, and myself, Jack Delosa, as well as many, many more. You'll walk away from this day with real world insights from people with been there, done that experience, based on the unconventional strategies we're employing today to thrive in business in 2021 and beyond. Now, a very limited number of tickets are available to attend both in person and digitally. So head to www.the-entourage.com slash unconvention to get your ticket now. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Make It Happen Show. This is a special episode where our founder, Jack DeLosa, interviews Amanda Lee Walker, the co-founder of Lord of the Fries. So in this interview, Amanda talks about how she built Lord of the Fries into an eight-figure business. And what I love about it is it wasn't around a fad. It wasn't around a trend. It was around a staple, French fries. So how she built a business out of that. Amanda also talks about how she overcame imposter syndrome, which is such a challenge for so many business owners. And then we had some live questions and answers from our members at the event that this interview was held at. So there's a lot of great stuff in here. It's a peek behind the curtain of how a great business is built. Let's get into it. Okay, round of applause for Amanda team. So... You're a boss. Hello. (laughs) Welcome. Thank you. We were having a chat this morning and within about 60 seconds, I was able to identify that Amanda is very, very entourage. Uh, So no doubt you've been fitting in well. Amanda, before we get into it, one of the things I want to sort of start with is um, one of the things you said in a previous interview uh, was that at the age of 15, there was a lot of stuff going on in your life and it was quite a crazy ride. So before we get to starting the business and and the journey from there, talk to us about how your teenage years. Interesting. Yeah, teenage years, very, very rough. So I guess it came into my teenage years with a lot of limiting beliefs that I was playing out, Um, you know, rejecting sort of love, rejecting support, rejecting teachers, running away from my parents, getting kicked out of school, finding all of the people that could support this sort of lifestyle with me. So I had a lot of friends in and out of jail. Um, But you'd be surprised. I mean, I had a really sort of strong family. Both my parents were working. They were both entrepreneurs. But um, yeah, I was just really sort of... uh, driving i was driven by by fear and uh fear of rejection fear of being not good enough and just manifesting experiences to support that and it ended up that i had to well my parents couldn't sustain this type of uh, teenager and i had to go move into a group home which was kind of exciting because i was like oh this is like where all the bad girls go um, but it was also a big wake up call because it was like very, this was really where shit went down, mm-hmm. you know, for people that maybe didn't have parents or that had some, some really serious trauma in their background. And I sort of, in this context, I was able to sort of start to wake up and realize that, that I've been creating a lot of the problems myself from my own thoughts and my own choices and my own yeah, beliefs about who I was and what, what, what I was capable of in the world. And, and in that way, I started sort of hanging out with the counselors and, and sort of switching the narrative from being the rebel to into to more like more of the healer, more of the mentor. And I sort of started rallying up the troops in the group home and trying to support them. How important was that adversity early on 
in enabling you to develop a resilience that would no doubt be required in your business life later on? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I think having that, or those early experiences allowed me to open myself up to, to the truth of who I am, what I believe in, being able to follow a life and follow a path and follow love that's that's in line with my with my real desires and and who I want to be in the world and how I want to support the world which is I, if some of you don't know this we have a vegetarian business or it's actually a vegan business which is you know part of how I wanted to contribute and I think if I hadn't been able to crack open and really expose myself to to the sort of the depths of who I was I probably wouldn't have the the strength to to be an entrepreneur. If people can become engaged in something really meaningful, then often you don't need to talk to them about the more surface level behaviors. Yeah. Um, let's talk business. So um, team, Amanda went from one food truck to 27 stores. Uh, she is now, uh, obviously with Lord of the Fries, uh, she's now the largest vegan food franchise in the Southern Hemisphere. 2018, they did $22 million in revenue. So this is a really successful uh, business. Um, one of the things, Amanda, you mentioned um, previously was you were living, your par uh, living with your parents uh, and it wasn't pretty for a long time, I can tell you that. How did you guys, if we go back to the early years of the business journey, yeah. how did you guys find and navigate the early days where there wasn't a lot of cash or capital around? Oh, okay. So I'm going to go back in, in time a little bit first to, because you said you guys, so I, I, if it's all right, I'd like Absolutely. to, yes. yeah. So uh, I'll just go back in, in my personal history. I was um, living in Toronto. I had turned everything around by then. So I was like on the good girl side of stuff, volunteering and <laughs> It was good. It was good. Volunteering in jail and all kinds of stuff. Like volunteering in jail. I wasn't in jail. <laughs> I could leave. So yeah, everything was going really well and I decided I want to travel, but I also really like to make money. So a really good opportunity in my um, 20s was to go to Taiwan, teach English as a second language. There's a great opportunity there. So I got my ESL. I went to Taiwan and did that for two years. I worked in Montessori in a women's college. And it was awesome. Um, but I was single, not consciously single. I'd been single for a few years. I'd done dating the bad boys. And um, I thought, you know, I'm not going to go out with anyone else so I get the right guy. And then I was about to leave Taiwan when they hired a new teacher to work at the school that I'd been teaching in. And he was going to take the kids I'd been with. So I was like, I got to meet this guy. So I went to meet him. I arranged to meet him. And we went outside and uh, he offered me to share a cigarette with him. And I thought, oh, wow, what a great guy at the time, at the time, <laughs> it's a while ago. And I was like, wow, okay, I wouldn't really share my cigarette with anyone. Who's this guy? And then we went for a juice and he pulled out of his, his backpack spirulina. I don't know if anyone's ever seen this green sea algae, but for vegetarians, I was like, oh, my God, this guy's amazing. Cigarettes and spirulina. <laughs> tick, tick. <laughs> And then he told me he was a journalist and a mus he loves music. And I went to his house and he had my favorite book on his bookshelf at the wow. time, The Unbearable Lightness of Being. I couldn't believe it. And then he tells me he's a vegetarian. And I was like, oh, my God, Mom, Mom, yeah, I found, I found the one. Yeah. <laughs> so we fell in love. Wow. And uh, we, we were starting to think, so now we're 26 or 25 or something like that. And we're thinking, wow. okay, well, what's next? We want to start our own business. Our value in vegetarianism is the, one of our biggest values. And so what can we do? So we started exploring, you know, what are our options in Taiwan? Well, nothing. Um, so what are we going to do in Australia? So we, we moved back to Australia and we thought, okay, uh, well, what can we do with $10,000? Not that much. We, we sort of tried a few things. That really, it's not, it wasn't a little, yeah, it's not a lot of money. We, we looked into opening a restaurant, but with that much capital, no, it wouldn't work. So we came up with the idea of a food van. So that's when, when we say we. So, yeah, we're still in love. We started a food van, and um, we did that for a year. And it was awesome. So you might want to know, yeah, what were we going to put in the food van? We really didn't know. We tried testing different ideas, calling festivals and that, thinking, oh, we can travel and serve food from this van. It'll be amazing. We'll listen to music. 
So we had different ideas and like organic foods and crepes and they all got shot down until we did some more market research and found out french fries was the go at the festivals. And by the way, at the time, french fries were cooked in beef, most of the, so we couldn't even eat them at the festivals. So we thought, okay, food van, french fry van. And we did that for a year and then Mark's brother joined. And then, then that, that's the us, that is the us. And then we opened our first store and then grew. That's, I love that story. It's that nice. is definitely worth telling. That was great. beautiful. I love it. Uh, yeah, round of applause. That's Thank awesome. You. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> That's nice. You can still see the love on your face right now as you think about That's it. That's cool. That's very cool. That's very cool. Uh, so we started uh, Food Van going around to festivals. Yeah. We're obviously bootstrapping in the early years. Yeah. Um, how, how did you find bootstrapping with not a lot of cash and capital in the business? Well, we didn't really know any different. Mm. So we just, you know, Mark's dad would paint the signs and we just thought it was cool. I, and we really didn't have like a bigger context sort of. And compared to the other vans, we were like so fresh and modern, even though when I look back, it really looks um, <laughs> very homemade. I think we all have that photo <laughs> somewhere, don't we? Yeah. It's like the first thing that we did. Like, oh. Yeah. But yeah. at the time, you know, so bootstrapping, it just seemed like fine. It seemed fine. Yep. Yep. It's fine. Now, you guys have obviously experienced some, some serious growth, become the biggest food chain in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, if, if we were to summarize the journey, what do you think have been the core factors that have enabled the high growth that you guys have experienced? Okay, great question. So having a product that is uh, desirable and um, isn't, is like, what's the right word? You know, French fries is like, I don't want to say timeless, but something like that. I mean, French fries probably are not timeless, but I kind of hope they are. So having a product that is so like... So do we. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, what's the word? Having a, a product that, that's has like... Has longevity? Yeah, has longevity. Yeah. It's, not, it's not really on trend. It's just like fries. So something like that. Humble. So it's a humble... Sus, sus, and, and it's following the trend of... The trend it is following is what is best for the environment, so, which is also like something that more and more people become interest, have become more interested in so yeah so follow a humble trend something that has longevity but also something that's that's relevant right now so it has both aspects right like that mm -hmm. old timey potato thing and that the interest in how can my business contribute to something bigger than just my customer mm -hmm. and and then having systems of course good systems mm -hmm. good training um good people mm -hmm. I love that. Before you got to humble and you started to talk about a trend, when you were talking about product, you said uh, it, it was timeless and it wasn't a trend. Yeah. I, I think I, I, I really resonate with that statement. I think it points to something really important. What did you mean by that? Well, it's something that is, um, it's just, it, it, it appeals to a lot of people. Mm. It um, is like a staple. Mm. It's, a, it's a staple. It's a basic. It's a it's like a little black dress, you know? Mm, it's mm. just water, potatoes, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, potatoes! Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, I love that not following. I mean, and, and you, you sort of rounded out by saying it, it was a bit of a trend, but it was also in the kind of undercurrent, so it would. So, so it was a trend and it wasn't at the same well, time. Yeah, the trend is that, that we are, well, and I hope it's not really a trend, but the awareness is, is that we're a sustainable business and we, well, we, we, ethical is, you know, you can use the word how you want, but yes, a sustainable business that is, is thinking about, okay, where are my suppliers from? Where, you know, who is this? How much waste are we generating? What is our contribution? What is our footprint? That type of thing. Mm. I guess that would be the trend mm. part, mm. but mm. I, I hope that that becomes, uh, as longevity, you know, as well. yeah, it yeah. Should, it's going to have to, totally. isn't it? One of the most interesting interviews I've ever watched is an interview where uh, Steve Forbes, the owner of Forbes magazine, interviews Jay-Z and Warren Buffett. Does everybody know Jay-Z? I take it we all know Buffett, right? Um, and I remember at the start, I was watching this interview on YouTube and I thought, whatever these two agree on, I'm going to take for absolute gospel. Because you've got one white guy from Oklahoma who grew up in a privileged environment who's gone on to become one of the world's, probably the world's greatest investor. 
right, white collar, that kind of stuff. And then you've got an African American gentleman who grew up in the ghetto and you know had to do lots of things to create his own foundation of money in the beginning and has gone on to sign himself and become a mogul in the music world. It's like they've come from two exact opposite yeah. worlds, but they've both reached this iconic level of success. And so I was like, whatever they agree on, I'm going to take as gospel. And the main theme throughout the entire interview for both of them was don't follow trends. Find what you're great at. And it's not to say don't push yourself outside your comfort zone or whatever, but it's like find what, only do what's true to you. Don't do something because it's hot in the minute. And so, yeah, I love, I love how you touched on that with regards to your own story. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. No, it feels, it feels, it's good. And also it being good. vegetarian can also be, or vegan can be a trend, but it, it's also true to us. It's my, uh, me and my husband and my brother-in-law. This is how we live. 100%. Yeah. I love that. Um, you've actually said that in previous interviews. You've said um, on the point of being a business with purpose, you were originally, I believe, uh, sort of branding as a vegetarian restaurant and ultimately uh, evolved that branding to be a vegan restaurant because that mirrored what was going on for you yeah. and Mark, yeah, right? right? Talk to us about that. Talk to us about the importance of the business being an authentic representation of who you are. Yeah, so Mark went vegan first and uh, Sam and I were vegetarian and, and, and then he sort of started pushing, but then there was a balance. Uh, so then we started kind of cutting out stuff slowly because we, you know, we love Mark. We, we, he, we admire him, and and it, it made sense in our in our hearts. Um, but for a business, you know, we couldn't just like pull the plug. We have a lot of franchisees at this point, and also customers that are com committed and connected to the product, and they like the way it tastes. And the also the cheese uh, didn't taste very good at that time, so we had to wait until. Um, so it's a balance between our personal desire to have a business that is very close in alignment to ourselves, but then also uh, it needs to be marketable, like uh, it tasted yucky. So we had to wait till the right product came, and then we we all took the plunge, and it was uh, it was a little bit scary. I love how you say that. It's a really important distinction. Have it be a representation of yourself, but also it does need to marry into yeah. what the world wants and when the world wants it or we don't have a business. Yeah, that's exactly it. So so we had to be patient, yeah. you know, but it, it's still working. And mm. it was actually so easy compared to some of the fears our franchisees might have had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about that. What's been the most challenging components of the journey for you? Yeah, I, I guess... Um, franchising is a is great because mm -hmm. you can grow your business but then you have a lot of different people maybe with different values different um, backgrounds different ways of working different priorities that you have to manage and try to make do things uh, yeah it's been very challenging learning how to inspire people but at the same time you have to like discipline them so it's sort of you know like who are you are you their friend we can't mm. really be their friend because then then they then, but then when they don't do stuff you have to tell them no you can't do that so it's a that's been the biggest challenge i guess personally because it's my area is i'm um, learning how to relate while taking on like a hundred different roles i'm still working on it how have you navigated it so far uh, so far started really soft, very friendly, going to go on that path. So didn't, wasn't satisfying to my partners. They're like, why is this happening? Why is that? Tried the other way, the hard line, that doesn't work. So now uh, I've reached out to a new coach <laughs> to <laughs> try something else. Yeah. Thank you. Let's keep trying. I love that. I, yeah. lo I, I really love the honesty of that answer. Thank you. Thank you for the honesty around that. Um, speaking of uh coach one thing that i know you help a lot of people females in particular move through is imposter syndrome which is yeah. something that everybody has um talk to us about imposter syndrome and and some of the strategies and tools you help people equip themselves with to move past it or through it okay. not that we ever really move past it do we to, yeah. to deal with it as effectively yeah. as possible to deal with it so it's funny because when when I sort of knew that that might be a topic you asked about. So then I'm thinking about imposter syndrome and then I'm here going like, I'm an imposter. <laughs> <laughs> so, so weird. Very ironic. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. So yeah, imposter syndrome is interesting because um, what I know about it personally, so you may know this, but I've been meditating for a long time. 
So the beautiful thing, if you commit to meditating, then you can hear your inner voices much more clearly. Mm. So then you can hear when the imposter is is voicing. So you, do, you some people just believe the voices. I'm not sure where everyone's at or if this is going to sound weird, but you know, when you have that... We're very weird. Yeah, okay, good, yeah. good, good. Yeah, weird works like The weird. weirder the better. So <laughs> when you can start to hear, okay, who said that? You know, you, you can decide, well, who's the, who's the driver and, and who's the engine, right? So um, first is to, is to become oh, self-aware, to hear, okay, where, where is this voice coming from? And then, and then I guess the next part is, is choice, choosing where to put your focus, right? So you, you can choose um, to believe this, this stuff about the imposter syndrome, which, which everyone would know is the, the voice that says, who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing? Well, they're better than you. Oh, there's already 100 fry businesses. Don't do that. Oh, um, she's smarter than you. He's better. All of that stuff. That's your imposter. And then, and then you go ahead and cancel the, the show or you volunteer someone else or you don't take the opportunity, right? It, it can hold you back from doing all of the cool stuff maybe that you, you, you want to do, like stuff like this, right? <laughs> if I let my imposter in, I would have said no, you know, because I would have been scared to, to, to be proven as a, a fool or stupid or, or not worthy or not rich enough, not successful enough, not anything enough, right? It's all about being not enough. In any case, through, through learning to quiet practices, listening to your inner voice, you, you can hear the, the voice of the imposter who's, who's trying to protect you, essentially, right? Just like saying a bunch of stuff to keep you safe so you never be vulnerable, you'll never be hurt, but then you'll never leave your house, you know what I mean? So, yeah, to be quiet and then to choose where to put your focus. Do you put your focus on, on trying to protect yourself or you put your focus on trying to, um, you know, connect with people or, or support people or inspire people or live your dreams or, you know, where is your attention going? That is the, the, the question. Where is my attention? Is my attention on my, my heart's desire right now? Is this who I who I really want to be, or do I want to be like this, you know? So, yeah, that's how I, I think imposter syndrome is, um, it's in the ego. Not, not Everyone's in the ego, but it's, it's not in your truth, you know? It's a, it's a trick. It's a trick. You play on yourself. I don't know why or how it works, but it's weird. <laughs> I really hope you guys are taking notes because that was a really good summary of moving through imposter syndrome when it comes up. If you didn't take notes, step number one, practice practices of quietness and stillness, yeah. meditation. That enables you to do step number two, which is witness the voice, mm. right? So many people we identify with the voice in our head. So it's, I'm saying this, I'm saying that we think we're one with the voice. What meditation does is it enables us to disassociate from the voice and rather being identifying with the voice, we understand we're the witness of the voice, right? So we're able to get distance from our own thoughts, which helps us choose step number three, which you're gonna believe, right? I, I will believe that, I won't believe that. I love what you said. The imposter syndrome isn't the real you. It's a, it's a survival mechanism that, that we've had to have for the last you know, few million years. And then step number four from Amanda was, and once you've done all of that, choose where you're going to focus your attention. Mm. Are you going to focus it on that voice or are you going to focus it on uh, something more meaningful and more productive? That was really cool. Yeah, that was really cool what you just did. <laughs> <laughs> was I was really listening. Cool. I was that like, was awesome. I love everything you just said. Yeah, uh, that was really great. cool. Thank you. Hey team, Jack here. Remember to get your ticket now for Australia's number one event for six, seven and eight figure business owners, The Unconvention, where you'll be hearing from the world's best entrepreneurs all on the one stage who are running businesses with a collective worth of $8.5 billion. If you want to accelerate profitable growth, if you want to build a business that can work without you, and if you want to harness and embrace the unconventional strategies the world's top entrepreneurs are using to thrive in 2021, make sure you get there. Head to www.the-entourage.com slash unconvention. This will sell out. Thank you. Um, if a business owner feels like their business is 
plateauing. Actually, I'm going to preface this conversation by saying, in a moment, team, I'm going to come to you guys. We're going to get mic runners, mm -hmm. and you guys will be asking questions. So I encourage you to ask whatever uh, you want to ask Amanda while we're lucky enough to have her. So just start thinking about that for the next couple of minutes. <clears throat> if a business owner feels that their business is at a plateau or going through a challenging period, uh, what's one thing that they can do to push past it, move through it, and make it happen? Okay, so the business is plateauing. Yeah, so I guess self-care. She like, what are you doing? Like, are you plateauing? What's going on inside? I, I would be jiggling my inside through any number of different things, like getting myself starting to be inspired, amazing podcasts, personal practices, stuff like that on one hand. And on the other hand, yeah, going back to the why. What, why did I start this? What is the purpose? What's my contribution? How can I, it depends on the business, but really, I guess, yeah, how can I, ah, yeah, what does this business need? Starting to maybe think of the business like a, a relationship. Yeah. You know, what do you need from me? So, well, wait, you guys are weird, so this is fine. <laughs> yeah, I have to remember. We're okay. With, <laughs> We're yeah, thinking, yeah, what is this? If it's an energy or something, what, what does it need? What does it need from me? And, and listening. There, there's a relationship is established between you and your creation. Mm. And um, yeah, but it, it also takes quietness, I guess. Mm. Yeah, so, so the self-inspiration, the quietness and... and uh, asking the business what it needs from you and then taking action from that. Is that something you're consciously aware of? Is that a practice you've consciously developed to, to, to always bring it back to you? Yeah, I think so. Why yeah. is that? Um, I suppose I, I know it, this is where it's all coming from. I, I mean, the, our results are, are coming from our choices, which are coming from our beliefs, which are, you know, so I get, I'm thinking it all starts with the self and how, how much you're willing to see, mm. who you're willing to be, what mm. you're willing to do. Mm. But, but that's all coming from the inside. So yeah, always starting with the self 100%. and growing from there. But, but then also just knowing the business is not the self. It's a creation, right? It's not personal. You don't need to identify with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What you were saying this morning was amazing. It's mm -hmm. true. As soon as it becomes so close to the business, but then what if the business uh, closes, mm -hmm. right? Does that mean like we close or do, if we sell it, does that mean we're, we're not important anymore? No, it, it's, it's its own thing. So to have that separation, but, but then again, you can only go as far as what... Yeah. <laughs> that is exactly how I view it. I yeah, love that. Yeah, yeah, I love you that. You can explain it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to. That was, yeah, that's... that was really, really good. That's yeah, true. How's Amanda doing so far, team? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> cool. So, team, I'll throw it over to you. Who'd love to ask our first question from the audience? Yeah, I'd love to go to the back there. Thank you. Hey, guys, it's Robbie here. Oh, shit, this is working. Um, <laughs> I'm not in the franchise space, but certainly during our mastermind yesterday, a lot of people spoke about the difficulties of franchising. Mm. Yeah. Certainly having 27 stores across the country would have been you know, rather difficult to manage and maintain. Yeah. My question is, why not just have them as employees under your banner, under your umbrella, under your standards, and just go and have them work remotely? What, what sort of led you down the path of doing the franchise model as opposed to just growing the business and you know, being able to performance appraise with them, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Thanks for asking. Um, yeah, we, we did try. You make it sound so easy when you say that. And I'm like, yeah, why didn't we do that? <laughs> yeah, it would sound so great. But uh, we, we sort of tried that. We tried it. We had five stores. <laughs> um, and then I had a, so we had five stores going and it was all cool and it was all working. And then I, I, I got pregnant. I'm still working. And then I had the baby and I hired someone to, to do the five stores. And, but then that, that person started stealing and then this store started doing weird stuff and that store did, and then I, that's why we started to franchise because I, I, I couldn't, uh, not just me, but yeah, I, I couldn't control it. It was just like, whoa, what's going on? There's all these people and um, that one, she, she's not help. She's not, there wasn't enough responsible people 
I didn't find the right people at the right time. So then we thought, okay, well, if, th if these guys own the store, well, of course they'll take care of it. And then we just, we just um, <laughs> say that, we just get the money. And then, right? <laughs> so, but they have to do the work. You slip into an Italian character yeah. every day. Get the money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm here yeah. with a mob boss. It's one of myself. <laughs> <laughs> we make them an offer they can't refuse. Yeah. <laughs> I can't do accents, clearly. Um, but that's a legit, I mean, because I, Robbie, I asked myself the same, I, I asked that question for years yeah. a little while ago, and, and I think for, for the, the, the response that I found, similar to what, what Amanda's talked about in her own experience, is it, it, it is a capital raising exercise. So sell a franchise, you know, whatever the franchise fee is to, to get them set up. Uh, it's it's a it's a capital raising mechanism. Um, how I've seen it done optimally is you do both. So mm. keep building out company owned stores at the rate in which your cash can facilitate, while franchising. So you've got kind of the best of both worlds. Yeah, that's what I'd like. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. We get the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get to keep a lot of it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, next question. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, let's give Robbie some love. Three, two, one. Yes, at the back. Hey. Hello. Hey. Uh, my question's kind of going to follow on from the same thing again. So um, we're at the point where we have three company-owned stores and we've just franchi franchised our first um, location. Luckily, it was to someone that we knew really well. So we had that trust that we, were be, uh, we could be like, okay, well, if there's something going wrong, you know, we can call up we can call them up like three times a day, um, you know, and we get the opportunity to be able to touch base and things like that. How did you, how did you figure out the values and things that you wanted in people um, to be able to franchise from you? Because that's what we're finding the hardest. We've had maybe 30 people approach us wanting to buy, which is crazy because we've only been going for two years. Uh, what has been the main things that you've looked for in people because the 30 people that have come to us, we've picked one. Yeah. Like, which is so good. Yeah. I, I, I think it sounds like you're doing the right thing. Mm. And um, it's better to have one mm. that's in alignment than have a whole bunch that are just anyone. Because it's actually a really big deal to franchise and to give someone your business. And the, it's, a, it's like a marriage. Um, polygamous <laughs> marriage or something. You have a long, <laughs> it's really deep and it's long and it's so much money and it's a lot at stake. It's a lot of times it's their life savings. Mm. And um, if you don't have the right people in there, which we've had and we also have have had not. Oh, it's tricky. So um, yeah. So I think that the, the better to grow slow. Mm and grow right yes. than to just try to grow, you know? Yeah. yeah. Which, Any, which, like, standout things, though, that you're, what, like... For the values? Yeah. It would like really they, be your values. Like, yeah. what, what's important to you? Like, is it integrity? Is it, you know, ambition is a good yeah. one. Um, oh, there's so many little bits. In, for us, we have a certain profile that really works. Yeah. Like, we love having vegetarian franchises because we know that that's, like, Bit, they're not going to try to slip meat in there because uh, and make them more money. Right? Uh, but, but that's not the highest value. But that's you yeah. know that's really important, and to 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 see that they've got that little entrepreneurial spark is very important to us. But then they they also need to be able to listen because they they have to be they're following a, a turnkey business, so they don't get to be all super inventive. Yeah. So so that's a, a a quality of a certain person that is that's willing to work hard, but not try to create a whole bunch of stuff without asking. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it would really, though, it's going to come from you, those, yeah. those qualities. And have there been opportunities, like, have there been times where you know, like, have you just trusted your gut on things? Like, without having any other instance, like, other than mm. I just don't feel right about this, yeah. so you haven't done it, because I try to explain that to my partner and anyone else we have in the business, and they're like, that doesn't make sense, you can't, yeah. like, <laughs> you can't just say your gut says that's not right, so we don't do that. I'm like, but I know, like, is there times that you've done that as well, or yeah, is that just me? No, 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 <laughs> yeah, 
I, I, I work a, lo a lot like that, but I do have two other partners, yeah. so I have to be uh, accountable to them. And mm. uh, sometimes I say, it's, this is not right, it's not gonna work, but then I get outvoted mm. by them, and sometimes I'm wrong, and sometimes they're right. It's our intuition. Yeah, which um, is strong. Very. Yeah. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Well, yeah, it's this, it's this power. Mm. It's a power to, it, it's a unseen power that we have to just know, to just be able to feel something, to, to feel if it's right. It, it, and then also I think you can know if it's coming from fear or just, just knowing. Mm. But it's a, it's a worthy skill to develop, especially as an entrepreneur, if you're trying to push, you know, there's no one in front of you, so you're, you're going into the unknown anyways. You know, this is a great quality to, uh, work on and mm. trust mm. it's very trust. um amazing mm. natural mm. supernatural yes yeah it totally is um what I love about that question is often when people start franchising, the criteria they have to select franchisees is like, there's two criteria. Do you have a check and do you have a pulse? If, if you do, then they'll take your money in. And what happens is they acquire, you know, eight to 10 franchisees, but they're the wrong people, they're the wrong fit. So the fact that you've taken one from 30 and that you're even having the conversation about values alignment and selection criteria tells us that you, you're asking the right questions. Yeah. yeah, let's give us some love. Three, two, one. Yeah. Who's next? Uh, yes, we're going down the back and then we'll come down the front here. Hello. Um, I sell commercial I sell commercial cleaning franchises um, and I have a lot of trouble with the communicating with them. So you touched briefly on that, but I'm wondering what sort of method you use to communicate. Do you have an app in place? Or, oh, good. You know, yeah, good yeah. question. I wish I could say like it's super high tech, but I actually use WhatsApp a lot. Okay. A WhatsApp and email. So it depends on the, because the, WhatsApp, I can see who's looked at it, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> Same. Accountability. <laughs> uh, yeah. But if it's something formal, email. Yes. And if it's okay. very serious, text message. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the hierarchy. Yeah. <laughs> and do you run like a monthly catch up or a yeah. weekly or Yeah, in terms of communication cadence. Yeah, yeah. Is there... okay. So we have monthly one to ones uh, on Zoom or in person. They like in person best, but it's not always possible. So Zoom's really great. Um, also we have monthly master classes, which is a really good idea, I think, on just everything. You know, yeah. you, you could probably, your people could really benefit from that too. Just some whatever, service, yeah. products, techniques, anything. You can invite different people in. It's really cool bumper. Um, and then we have quarterly uh, larger meetings with more um, people involved, finances, marketing, da-da. And then we have annual more fun meetings, but monthly, definitely. All right, thank you. Yeah, too, longer than a month, it's too long. And then yeah. you can't, there, their sales and everything can just go, go wild. And yeah, I, do the, I do them separately, 30 minutes every month with six questions. Okay. Uh, just the same questions, boom, 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 like that. Yeah. And, and I always try to find out what they're upset about, because if you <laughs> don't find out what mm. they're upset about, then they mm. blow up some other area. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. That's great, I love that. Yeah, let, yeah. It, let them release their tension. Yeah. They're often upset about something, no offense to them, but you know, it's, it's hard it's for them. 100%. Yeah. And often as managers and leaders, we can do the opposite, right? Like if we think something's up, we always skirt around it. Yeah. And I love that it's built into a template that you actually go seeking yeah. for to, to, what's up. To de... de Defrag. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Release the heat. <laughs> Pressure valve. Love it. Yeah. Thank you. Let's give us a love. Three, two, one. Hi, I'm Susanna, and thank you very much, and congratulations on all of your success. Um, you mentioned earlier that you um, were pregnant at, um, in an earlier part of um, your business career. Um, I'm interested to learn, have you experienced um, guilt about sort of how much time and energy you've put into your business, um, either with your family or friends or other things, um, you know, your other passions, um, and how do you, how have you responded or or managed um, that kind of, like I experience it as mum guilt, but I know everybody else experiences it in different ways. And yeah, do you have some tips for or, how, or the way you approach managing that? Yeah, so definitely, um, definitely guilt, but guilt is not really like it's, 
it, I, I recognize that like my strengths are more in my business than, um, than my parenting in a way. Um, that feels a little bit hard to say, but I, okay, what I'm, I'm still working through it. What I'm trying to do lately is remember when I'm with my kids, I don't need to be with my business. I can be like, I'm trying to imagine even putting on a hat, like mom now, be mom now. It's actually very tricky for me to not just want to be doing my business growth all the time or growth or meddling, managing, touching it, doing all kinds of, and, and then the kids, they feel that and it, that doesn't feel good and it doesn't feel right. So, um, but it's very difficult because uh, most of my energy goes toward that business. So yeah, it's just becoming more conscious of it and, and creating pockets of time to be just present with the kids and asking them to, to tell me if um, I'm not paying attention to them. Same with my husband, I ask him uh, permission before I speak about business after hours. So creating like boundaries around things um, helps. But, 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 but yeah, it's hard and, it, and it's, um, it's awkward. And I feel, yeah, if I could go back in time, I, I might do things a little bit differently, but I only have f f now, so I'm trying to to um, be, be more conscious of the fact that I, I don't need to work when I'm with my kids. Yeah. I think we need to have that us, need to have that conversation a little bit more because yeah. it, it's such a common thing common. that comes up, particularly when I'm doing Elevate Masterminds and particularly mm -hmm. for mums. It's a, it's, it's a deep seated thing that's very real. Uh, so like, I think we think about how we facilitate a conversation around that, even if we do that during one of the breaks over the next couple of days. <clears throat> um, what about dads? Does it happen to dads? Absolutely it does. And I don't, I, yeah, and, and I, I'm, I personally, I'm not a parent, but it, it, I, I imagine it would absolutely occur to dads. Exactly. I just think it's, it's, it's particularly emphasized yeah, it's for, a for mums a lot of the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm generalizing, but yeah. uh, for example, when I'm in masterminds, it's often mums that, that, that bring it up. Mm. Um, so yeah, thank you for asking that, and and let's see if we can facilitate a a, a, a deeper conversation around that over the next couple of days because I really want. How awesome! Yeah, yeah. totally awesome. That's you could so share awesome. it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I need to be in it. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, make it happen in a minute segment. Do you know what this is? Tell me. It's where I ask you five questions, rapid fire, oh. and you answer them rapid fire. Okay. And this is what we end on. All right. Are you ready? Yeah. Ready. Okay. Sure? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's do it. Number one. What's your biggest lesson from 2020? Um, meditate. I love that. <laughs> I think that's got to be, yeah. I should have prefaced this, but I think that's got to be your answer to question number two. What is the one thing every entrepreneur could do that would dramatically improve their life? Um, the daily habits. Cool. You Good. know what I mean. Yep. What's your favorite type of... <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite type of fries? Oh, well, classic with gravy. Classic with gravy. Chop sure. that down when you go to Lord of the Fries. So good. Uh, What's, oh, I like this question. What's one thing you tolerated as a business owner in the early stages of Lord of the Fries that you no longer have space for? Okay, um, people making excuses as to why they didn't do things. Yes, I absolutely love that. And how do you have that conversation? Um, remember before you were talking about circumstances versus yeah. strategy? Yeah. Something like this. Yeah. Yeah, like who's Getting the boss? Getting to take then? responsibility. Yeah, responsibility. Who, yeah. who is who's leading this? If it's not you, you know this type of question. Yes. Questions. Love it. Good yeah. Questions. Uh, final questions. If we could go back to the day you started the business, yeah. what would you tell yourself then, knowing what you know now? Oh, um, stay focused on your business. Stay focused. Uh, give as much attention, uh, but like with love. Don't um, get too distracted with other shiny, fun things for a while. Because if you focus, uh, then you'll, you'll get more freedom faster. Something like this. Do you know what I mean? I know exactly what you, mean. What I mean. Amanda Lee Walker. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give her a huge... Thank you.
Round of applause. Well done. Thank you. Thank well you. done. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Make It Happen Show. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. And it doesn't need to end there. We've actually gone and grabbed a whole bunch of extra resources for you. Behind the scenes footage, videos from this and all the other episodes, as well as show notes that you can grab for free. Just head along to www.the-entourage.com slash podcast and you can grab all those extra resources. Thanks for tuning in and I cannot wait to introduce you to our next guest on the next episode.